you, you f spoke at length and, and exhibited for us in, your, uh, in the films and the results of the tests you've been conducting, the e extraordinary influence of all of those complicated judgments and assessments that we make below the threshold of conscious uh, awareness. And I think by the end of your lecture, everyone sitting in the audience would have to grant that, uh, that there is a, an elaborate machinery of ju judgment concealed from view, from our own view of, our, of ourselves. And you used the phrase eternal vigilance as, a, as a, a way of expressing your sense that we need to be aware of that hidden machinery and conch and, and and constantly and consciously on guard to see that it doesn't carry us in directions that on reflection we would prefer not to go. And I, the question I'd, I'd like to start with today is this. Eternal vigilance su suggests a personal ideal, an ideal that each of us might adopt on his or her own for him or herself but it also suggests a whole range of social programs and policies that we might adopt to reduce the likelihood that, that our unconscious prejudices um, are influential in the uh, things we do and the way we construct our lives together. For example, just to make the point concretely, uh, jurors sitting in a jury box evaluating the testimony of witnesses and the like are making all sorts of judgments all the time, many of them presumably below the threshold of awareness and, and perhaps uh, making them in a prejudiced fashion. Wouldn't it be, uh, uh, wouldn't it be consistent with a program of eternal vigilance to require jurors to submit to an implicit attitudes test or something like that and achieve a certain score of, uh, of neutrality or unbiasedness before putting them on a jury and requiring policemen and policewomen before we send them out on the beat to take a similar test and perhaps to retake it every month or two. What do you think? Well, I think that the term vigilance um, is an interesting one to have picked, and I hadn't really thought about it until uh, the moment came to write this particular lecture. So um, I should say that in many ways, preparing uh, for this lecture has made me think about um, how our data may really extend into the kinds of domains that, that you're raising, Tony. The, the word vigilance uh, really has at its heart um, something conscious. How can one be vigilant unless one is um, not aware? And so to be using the word vigilance to refer to phenomena that by their very nature uh, are lie below the surface of awareness is I think itself somewhat ironic. But the point was uh, exactly the one that you make, that, that vigilance in this case uh, may need to take a different form. Uh, vigilance first in recognizing that there might be ways in which we deny people mental due process, uh, which is the term I also used in the lecture, um, might be the very first step. And then there might be di different paths to go. Uh, let's just take two different ones. On the one hand, it may be conceivable that we can do certain things, that we can educate ourselves, place ourselves in environments that may change these implicit thoughts and feelings and so on, such that over time, the magnitude of these biases themselves may be reduced. That's one, one way in which we might go. Um, the other is simply to be aware that one might have these biases and to do some explicit sort of correction. So um, I can mentally say, well, if my score is a score of X, um, when I now make a decision, whatever it might be, to use your example, if I'm a juror, a teacher, uh, a police officer, that I'm going to consciously correct. I might overcorrect or undercorrect, but I'm going to try and do something with this knowledge that I have uh, about the uh, likelihood that I'm going to be uh, biased. So these are both possibilities, and, and, and I see them 
Uh, and these are only two of many ways in which we might, might proceed. And I think your question about the role of institutions is, is, is especially critical because I think that as, as one acquires a position of greater power, um, the question of, of how we might change procedures that are inherent in institutions uh, becomes quite important. An individual person can make decisions and follow a certain path of action, but institutions, even more importantly, I think, need to come to terms uh, with, with, with eternal vigilance in a, in a new way. Mm. Yeah. Uh, related to this, it, it occurred to me when you were uh, lecturing on, on Tuesday that one strategy for combating or reducing, containing the influence of these unconscious prejudices is to give oneself more time in the making of decisions where they might be engaged. Um, I, I was struck by the fact that, that, um, uh, the, the, that many people who are conscious egalitarians, who espouse um, principles of fair treatment and equality as, as conscious uh, principles of action are nevertheless just as likely, perhaps maybe even more likely, to be drawn along by unconscious prejudices that conflict with their conscious uh, convictions. And those unconscious prejudices will be most potent when you have to make a snap decision under the pressure of time. So if one can avoid snap decisions or stretch them out a bit, that may be a way of increasing the influence of your conscious convictions in the decisions you make and reducing the influence of the unconscious prejudices. That, that's right. That's very plausible. I think that, that extending things out in time, thereby giving um, the, the individual person or mind the occasion or the opportunity to be able to call to mind conscious values of egalitarianism and so on is certainly one possibility. Each of us, under time pressure, uh, can think of things that we've done and said that we might later regret. And the reason is that in that moment we didn't believe that we had uh, access to our conscious, deliberate thoughts and so on. Um, but it may well be the case that, that what I spoke about is not restricted to only those types of situations. It may well be that even if one had all the time in the world to make a decision, that one might still be biased because one is simply not aware of those forces that are influencing a particular decision. So I could, with hours um, of time, come to a conclusion that may be quite biased um, because each, at each step I am simply not aware of what it is that is influencing my judgment. So uh, philosophers and psychologists who study consciousness speak about different components of consciousness. There is the component of awareness, um, and if one is not aware, then one can't do very much about the behavior uh, simply because the connection between the cause of the way in which one is thinking and, and how one actually thinks is, is simply, that connection is simply not made. The other aspect of consciousness, and that's the one that you're raising when you talk about time, is, is the component called control. Um, and I think when one drives a car or whatever, you come to terms with sort of the degree of control one can exert on a particular action uh, in, in an obvious way. And that part of consciousness is indeed what we've been studying in the kinds of experiments that I spoke about. And then, of course, there is uh, another component of consciousness, intention, you know, the ability to be able to perform the act that one intends to perform. And again, time would be something that would help. And, and finally, of course, this uniquely human capability to self-reflect, a fourth dimension of, of consciousness. And I think all of these um, are ones that go into this mix of what produces a particular set of thoughts or behaviors. And uh, I think each of them have kind of different downstream effects on, on behavior. But it takes me back to the, 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 the early part of our conversation. Again, two ways, let's say, very simplistically speaking, in which one might uh, expect to see changes in, in implicit prejudices. Um, and that one of those has to do with the environment in which one, one lives. Um, generations, people who were born at different times, um, will certainly show evidence of different types of both conscious and, I would argue, implicit sorts of prejudices simply because uh, their minds reflect the worlds in which uh, they live. Um, so one way in which implicit 
um, um, uh, prejudices and these, these simple associations may change is in response uh, or reflect uh, the world that, that we're in. So one passive way to bring about change is simply to change people's world. Somehow you engineer a world in which the normal sets of associations get turned around in some way. And, and then those will, at some level, just simply passively be reflected in one's implicit or automatic uh, beliefs and prejudices and so on. 